Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to give a quick um, recap of sort of the high points of last time to really reinforce the things that we're going to start building on today. And then we'll start building on them and, and look at some more specifics uh, from it. Um, the main points of last, uh, last lecture, once we got past the, uh, you know, the housekeeping business, was to talk about uh, dynamic websites. And really, if you think about it, you're really hard pressed to think of any websites that are around that are static. Most of the websites that you would talk about as being like popular websites or that you visit all have at least some component that's dynamic. And what that means is they are responsive to certain things. They're responsive to user input. They're responsive to who the user is. They might be responsive to the time of day it is. You know, if I were to go and look up uh, the TV schedule, for example, on NBC tonight, um, it would show me one thing. If I look it up tomorrow, it's going to show me something else. The only thing that's really changed is the fact that, well, it's a different day. At any rate, um, these dynamic websites really is about what makes the web what it is. You know, initially, uh, a lot of the early sites on the web were called brochureware because they were really just, you know, online versions of a company's brochure. But things really have matured quite a bit since the web uh, first arose to where really the web is an application development platform. All right. And there really isn't tons of difference between someone that calls themselves a software developer and someone that calls themselves a web developer. So it's really largely a matter of emphasis. All right. Um, okay. And what we talked about, one of the points that we talked about was that in the model for In the model for server-side scripting for dynamic sites, I guess that ain't working. Oh well. In the model for server-side uh, uh, scripting, the difference is really that um, instead of the web server simply taking HTML files and delivering them, which is what happens with static sites, the web server does some processing and uses some server-side scripts to process maybe the form data that came in, maybe data from a database, maybe data from other sources, and create on the fly an HTML document. And that's a key thing to remember. Um, some folks might talk about, you know, might say, gee, server-side scripting, why do we bother learning HTML if we're just going to turn around and not write HTML? We're going to write scripting language. That's not really the case, all right? Because keep in mind that the scripting language, its output is HTML. So you have to know HTML to write the script to write HTML. All right. Secondly, um, most server-side scripts are really a combination of some plain old HTML plus some special um, server-side coding. All right. So yeah, uh, these things still get translated to HTML, so it's still important to know HTML. Um, we talked about there being a variety of platforms for server-side scripting. PHP being one of them, Perl, Python, Ruby on Rails, goes on and on and on. And the one that we're interested in this class is ASP.NET. Now, the strength of ASP.NET is it provides a really robust framework all right, for creating web applications. And what does it mean when we talk about a framework? We said it was like a, 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 a set of components that we can use. It provides a starting point, all right, where you don't have to do every single thing yourself. Some of the code is, is written for you. And you're just uh, assembling and uh, connecting components that are pre-written, all right? I guess. I, I always thought I had a great definition of what a good framework was or what a good really any kind of software tool is until I read a better definition of it. All right? What I thought was a good definition is that a good framework or a good software tool allows me to do simple, common things easily. All right? 
the edition I read, someone else said the same thing, which kind of bummed me out because I thought this was an original thought of mine. All right, it turns out someone said it before. And they added on to it, in addition to that, in addition to doing the simple common things easily, it allows you to do more complicated things. All right? A good framework doesn't do everything for you, uh, obviously. A good framework, though, provides you a starting point and does some of the, helps you do some of the easy, basic, common things that you're going to do uh, very easily. And then allows you to write custom code to do the rest of the stuff. So you're still writing some code. You still, your whole job isn't done from you. But look at it this way. In any sort of job, if someone does a certain percentage of the work for you, I'll happily do the rest of it as opposed to taking on the entire task myself, right? <laughs> if I have to cook uh, a meal every day, if someone takes care of it on Thursdays and Fridays, hey, I'm happy, all right? Um, I'd rather do that than have to take care of them all, all seven days a week, all right? So that's what the ASP.NET framework does. Now, before we look at some specific things, what are some common things that you think happen in a web application? What are some things that, that you might find in many, many different web applications? Any thoughts? Think of, of dynamic pages like we talked about before. Input boxes. Yeah. Form, form processing, input boxes, and, uh, and, and drop downs and all that. And not just the, the entry of the data, but the processing of the data, all right? We learned in the H basic HTML class how to enter data into a form, all right? We, that is just plain old HTML. But more importantly, what happens to it after the user clicks the submit, uh, uh, select button, that's really one of the things that's pretty common. So oftentimes, you know, it will hit up against a database and do a query. You know, you might do a search on something and, and pull up a list of, of things. Or you might take the data that you enter in and check it up against the database when you log in, let's say. Or you may take the data that you enter in and actually write it to a database. All right? Like when you submit an a, a assignment in Angel. You log on, right? It checks the database, takes your form data, checks the database, says if you're valid or not. If you go to upload something, when you upload it, it takes that information and stores it in some table in Angel system, saying that so-and-so uploaded this on this date and time, and here's the attached file. So that's an example of uh, some common functionality that uh, many, many different web applications would do. Any other, any, anything else besides the processing of the data that is common in many web applications? Yeah, the validation of the data, all right? Actually, the inputting the data really is, is, is multifaceted. There's a lot of things that are, are, are very common with that. One of them is doing something with it, namely saving it in a database or querying a database with it. The other one is, uh, is validating it before you do anything, you know? Gee, I don't want to be able to um, submit an order to Amazon without putting a, 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 an address to where it needs to be shipped or without putting my credit card number in. All right? So that's something that happens on just about any web application, right? Because just about any web application in which you enter data, you want to make sure that data is right. All right? Text boxes in HTML are just that, text boxes. You can type anything you want to in them. Well, there needs to be code to make sure that it's, it's valid what you've typed in. So if it's expecting a number, you give it a number. If it's expecting a date, you give it a date, and so on. So those are two of the very common things. And the thing that you'll find is, as we start to explore these different um, components in, in, in ASP.NET is that for many of the ones that we've talked about and many others as well, there are things built into the language that give you a head start at handling it. And really that's where the power comes in, you know. Does some of the work for you? Instead of creating something from scratch, you're simply configuring and connecting components together, integrating components together. It's done in a consistent way uh, across m potentially multiple developers. Again, a lot of advantages. All this leads to higher maintainability, um, 
probably a little more reliability as far as testing goes, um, and so forth. So let's start out with one that may not be found in every web application, but is found in a lot of web applications anyhow. And that is a calendar. You know, you might see calendar on any number of different web applications. Now we could all, I'm assuming, write the HTML to create a calendar, right? What would a calendar be? What would be the HTML tags that you'd have for a calendar? Yeah, it'd be a table. And it would have five or six, four or five or six rows, depending on how many weeks were in the month, and it would have seven columns, so that'd be, you know, bunch of TRs, within that there'd be seven TDs, all right? And then you can style it any way that you want to to get a certain look uh, uh, on it, all right? And you could all do that, all right, if, if you had to. If I, if I gave you um, a laptop and said, here, make me a table that shows me the month of January, you could all do that. But the idea is, all right, we might want to do more with it. We might want to actually show events on those calendars. We might want to go forward a month and back a month. You know, if we're in January, show February and March, or go back to December and November. All right. So we might want um, a little more functionality for that. So there's a component in the .NET framework that allows us to do that. So let's start out today by looking at that one, and we'll use that sort of as an example to explore sort of the philosophy and how this stuff sort of works. All right. I'm going to go into visualstudio.net, which has been installed. And I'm going to create an application. you're really quiet, you can hear the squirrels in the computer running a little faster there. All right. I'm going to go in, and again, this is how I would sort of suggest you start all your projects. Go up to File, New, Website. And when you do that, you can Choose where you're going to put it. Now, if you're hooked up to a web server, you can actually connect to that web server and actually have your code go right up on that web server. But we're going to be doing everything locally on our machine. Uh, Visual Studio has built within it sort of a development web uh, server, and that's what we'll use uh, in these examples. So we're going to select file system. We can select where we're going to put the file. You know, putting it on your thumb drive is a good idea. You know, that way you'll, you'll be sure to take it when you leave. Uh, I'll, for probably most of these, put it on my desktop. And I'm going to give the name of the folder for my application. All right, so I'm going to call this controls. Because we're going to play around with some of the .NET controls in this um, example. So, I'll, all right, it warns me that that folder doesn't exist. Here is where we could choose between Visual Basic and Visual, Visual C Sharp. All right. Most of the examples, or all the examples we'll do in this class will be Visual Basic. I click OK. Thinks about it for a while. And I made a mistake. All right. I did, not, not a mistake per se. I didn't do what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to pick an empty website, yeah, and, and I picked that. I'll tell you what, just for the heck of it, we'll go into this to see what it gives you, then we'll go back and redo it, all right? Now, notice what it gave us. It actually gave us a bunch of stuff, all right? If you remember last time when we created an empty website, we just got a web config file. Here we got a web config file, a master file, all right, or a site master file, a global ASAX, a default ASPX it made for us, an about ASPX it made for us, a styles folder with some default CSS, some scripts library, jQuery libraries, 
a folder for us to put data if we want to, and a folder for logons. All right. And if we run this or test this application, we'll see we got the nice start of a little application. There is telling me that it's firing up the .NET development server. You typically will get this error, or not error, but warning message the first time. Just click OK. And what we get is trying to time it so <laughs> it ends exactly at the right time. Yeah, it's very slow. It's not me that's doing it. It's the machine, so you're not insulting me. All right, here we go. Maybe. What I should do is I should like sell sponsor sponsorship. So like there could be a commercial up there on the screen, you know, while we're waiting for it. And you know, I don't know, we'll use the money to buy pizza uh, and all that. Actually, someone looks like someone increased the size of the text. And you know, see we got a nice little start with a nice little menu bar and it makes a home page for us, an about page, some links on it. So it did give you a little bit of a head start for that. But that's no fun, right? We want all the fun ourselves. We don't want to just use what they've done. So I'm going to go back out and delete this. And we'll start again. This time we will, um, this time we will create uh, an empty one. All right, so I'll go up to File, New, Website. All the things I said before apply. Do, by the way, give a name to your website. Don't just leave it as Website 1, Website 2, Website 3. You know, make a, le a little effort to give it uh, a descriptive name. Click OK. Yes. And this time I will click create an empty website and click OK. And it will go through the process and it will give us the folder like it did before, but that folder only has a web config. Web application, an ASP.NET web application has to have an ASP config. So, um, or I'm sorry, a web config. So it gives you that one for free. We can look at it here. We're not going to do a lot with it now. But later on in the course, we'll put some of our, some entries in there, some parameters that are true for the whole application. All right, I'm going to go in, say, File, New, File. And I'm going to make a web form. Again, Visual Basic. I would suggest you always pick place code in a separate file. That's just a better way to do it. Um, that will give you the two files, the ASPX file and the ASPXVB. I think there's a couple of examples in the book, the first couple where they put everything in one file. That's not horrible, but I would prefer not to do it. The next thing uh, option they have is select master page, which we will not do now, but we will do later on in the course. Uh, a master page is sort of a template that you can clone to make copies of. So if all your websites have a header, and a side navigation and a footer. You can create that code, put it in a master file, and then clone all your pages from it. A real nice, nice little feature. But we're not going to use it. All right, so I will click that off and click Add. All right. What you'll notice when we do this, by the way, and the first page it creates for you, unless you change the name, is default.aspx. You should have your 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 assignment sort of home page should be default.aspx. Now this is just a one page assignment, your first assignment, so it will be the only page. But as we go forward, you should at least have one home page for your application called ASPX. And if you notice, as I said before, 
really, if you look at this, this is so far plain old HTML code. All right. HTML, head, title, body, and so on. And we can use this as a nice little HTML editor that has IntelliSense in it. IntelliSense where being you start something and it, it fills it in. Now, there's two views that you can go into when you're editing your page. The ASPX page, which is the visual part of your web page. There's the source, actually there's three views that you have. You have the source view, which is just like a basic text view of it. You have the design view, which is a graphical view, where you can drag and drop and put things on that way, sort of like a WYSIWYG editor. And then there's the split view that actually does a little bit of both. It shows you the graphical view and it shows you the, uh, the actual code. We'll probably bounce between those views. I simply find some things easier to do in one versus the other. All right? It's really largely a style issue. You'll find what works for you. Um, one thing that I do not like to do is I do not like to do styling for the most part through the graphical view. I would just as soon go in, by styling I mean changing the appearance, changing the position of elements. I would rather go in and, and write the code myself, write the CSS code and, and apply the CSS code, create a separate file. Uh, I've had nothing but headaches trying to do it graphically through, through Visual Studio. All right, so we have our toolbar here, or toolbox, that we can tack up on there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I'm going to drag one of these calendar controls over right into the middle of my text. So I'll click on calendar, drag it over, and pop it in there. All right. And what we get sort of looks like an HTML tag, but it isn't an HTML tag. All right. It starts out with ASP, ASP and then a colon. Strictly speaking, ASP is, is what's called a namespace there. All right, it, it's indicating that that's not really an HTML tag, that's an ASP tag. Now, these different things, we could call them components, we could call them controls, elements. Um, I'll probably use all those names. The name that I probably most often use is either component or control. So this is an ASP.NET control. All right, now... As we said, the whole idea of server-side scripting is these ASP.NET controls translate into HTML. So on the server, that's the code. When we run that page through the web server, it will process it and it will take this code, this control, and translate it into standard HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So let's go and run this page and see how this one line of an ASP.NET control translates to a big chunk of HTML that has JavaScript and CSS and all sorts of things associated with it. So let's go and run this. This compile is brought to you by Folgers Coffee. When I need a little pick-me-up before my Thursday evening class, I brew a pot of Folgers Coffee. Pardon me? Yeah, or I need something, yeah. Might have to go for a Red Bull on this one. All right. It's doing its thing again. It fires up its development server. And there we go. All right. Now, let's look at this two different ways. Remember, don't get confused because in this particular example, my computer is serving two roles. My computer is both the client and the server. So it's important to understand and be able to view it from both perspectives. When I'm viewing it in the web browser, this is the client view of it. 
And if we do a right mouse here and view the source, you'll see plain old HTML with some JavaScript thrown in. And sure enough, there is a table that our ASP.NET control generated. So that one line of ASP.NET control generates all this. That's what I mean about it taking something that's simple and straightforward and does it for you. All right, or does a lot of it for you. And all you have to do is assemble those components and possibly configure them or connect them or integrate them with other components. So this is a view on the server. Right? This is the server side code. This is the ASP.NET code. This is a view that you get on the client. All right? Now, let's go briefly to the design view. And I'll go up and say stop debugging. Depending on what your default browser is, if you have Internet Explorer, when you close out of the window, it typically stops debugging automatically. With Firefox, it doesn't really realize that you close the window, so sometimes it stays in debug mode and you have to go explicitly and shut it down. Uh, I'm going to go into uh, design view then. Again, we'll, we'll spend at least some time in each of these, each of these modes. The one thing that, that I want to avoid is a sort of an over-reliance on the IDE. You know, this is your code. The IDE is great and it can do a lot of good things for you, but um, you want to take command of the code and not be, you know, uh, sort of a victim of, of the way the IDE wants to do things. That sounds very sinister, and, and it actually is very sinister. All right. I can click on this if I want to, and I can auto-format it. So I can go and I can give a particular look to this. And what it's going to do is it's going to apply some CSS to that code. All right, so now it will look that way. I can go if I want to and make it bigger and go from there. Where is it stored in the CSS changes? All right, well, let's look at the code. If we look, now notice, notice how before it was one line. Now that control got a lot more complicated. All right, in other words, it has some of these more, some, some, some more of those ASP.NET controls. Between the ASP calendar start and end tag, there's actually all these little things that specify exactly how it should be formatted. Day header style, the font bold is true, and font size is this. Now, this is one thing that can be confusing, and um, in a way it's good because there's flexibility on how you do it, in a way, it's bad because there's the potential for confusion and conflict. You can actually style something on your ASP.NET page a couple different ways. First of all, you can style it using plain old HTML and CSS code. I could put CSS code to make tables look a certain way. All right? Or I can style it through the ASP.NET controls. All right? This may generate CSS code, but it's not CSS code. All right? It is ASP.NET code that I created using that design view and dragging things around and clicking on things and doing that. So depending on your strengths, you can either choose to create the CSS yourself or you can go in and allow um, you know, allow it to create styling for you. So there's a lot of choice with that, which in a way is good. The good news is if you're weak on CSS, you can use some of these tools to, to compensate from it. The bad news is, is that sometimes things get in the way of each other if there's a couple ways to do it. What I'm going to do in a second here is I'm going to create another calendar and I'm going to style it using CSS, all right, to show you um, how you could style it via CSS. All right. Is there any 
the efficiency I would I, I would say how do I want to put this the issue I would be concerned with would be the issue of maintainability all right in other words if I had several pages all of which had calendars if I styled them through this way I would run the risk of having them styled inconsistently. Because if I chose to change the scheme, I'm liable to hit three of the four pages and forget the fourth. Or even if I remember all of them, it's four times the work. Whereas if you style it via CSS, you know, it's there and, and it can, you know, it can go throughout the site. There's also something that we'll talk about later on um, that are themes within ASP.NET. And that is sort of a combining the best of both worlds. Um, and it allows for reusability and all that. But that would be the issue for me more than efficiency. All right, let's go and run this and we, and we can look at what it generates now. Not so much in how it looks, but, but the code it generates. And if we right mouse on this and do a view page source, we can see it. And notice it uses all of them uh, inline styles. So it actually puts an inline style on all of those. So probably this would probably be for uh, you know a, a bigger bigger download. But whether that was truly big enough to make an issue, you know, I, I don't know. So this probably generates more code. Um, whether that's a huge issue or not, uh, I'm not sure. Now the one thing I, I neglected to show last time is there's actually a little bit of JavaScript built in here as well that allows you to sort of navigate between the months. So you can go backward and forward. Again, the idea and the thing to keep in mind is we have one ASP.NET control that generates all this code. Generates the CSS, generates the JavaScript, generates the HTML for that table. And so for us to create it, we create that component. It's an ASP.NET component. The web server, when it does its thing on it, it processes it and um, displays results. Now, interesting thing. Interesting implication of this. If you are in uh, the web development class, a lot of times you might just do something like this. Let me open up a browser. I teach the 216 class earlier today. I taught it earlier today. You might just do this. Hey, here's my web page. Let me pop it in the browser and you can view it. All right. Can't do that with the ASPX page. Let me find it first of all. There, there it is. Oh, you know what? I bet you I messed up and called it website one. I did. It doesn't know what to do with it. Why did I get an error here? Yeah, because the server has to process it. In other words, that ASPX file itself is a recipe for a web page. It's not a web page. It's the instructions to create a web page. It has to go through the server to take that and, and bring it to life and to make it a full-fledged uh, web page. So if you do that, if you simply open it in the browser, um, you know, you're not going to get the results that you want. All right. Uh, what I'm going to do is to illustrate how I might style it otherwise and to show sort of the connection between these, I'm going to create a div and I'm going to give it an ID of custom. And I'm going to put another one of these calendar controls inside that. Okay. So if I run this, we'll have two calendar controls. The one fancy one that it styled for me and the one basic one that just has the defaults. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to style um, this one to, to look a little different. All right. Now, to review CSS, You can attach styles to HTML tags, 
All right. You can attach styles to IDs and you can attach styles to classes. All right. There might be a couple other things, but those are the three biggies that you can attach styles to. And you can mix and match. For example, I could say any table that has such and such ID or any table within such and such div or things like that. Now, you might be tempted to do this. All right? You can tell already it's something that's not going to work, right? <laughs> Let me go and create a CSS file. New file. Style sheet. And I'll go in and I'll apply that file to my page. And just for laughs, I'm going to go in and put something in this style sheet for the body, just to give the background a different color, just so that we know that the style sheet worked. So I'll say background pound light gray. All right, so we know the style sheet worked. All right. Now, you might be tempted to do this. All right. What is it that I want to apply a style to? Well, I want to apply a style to this ASP calendar. All right. Now, do you think I could do this? ASP calendar and start putting some style rules there. No. Why not? That's not an HTML tag. That's not going to be an ASP calendar control on the client in the browser. By the time the browser gets it, and the browser is the one that renders this CSS, that has been translated into HTML tags. So, how could I apply a style to this calendar and not that calendar? Pardon me? Well, I have a div, so what could I do? Okay. So I could say pound sign custom. Then let's say I don't want everything in that div, but just this table to have some behavior. What could I do? Like let's say there's other text in here. Let's say there's a paragraph. Let's say I want to make this table yellow, whereas I want to keep that paragraph gray, which is the default coloring. What would I do? If I said custom background yellow, what's going to happen? Well, that whole div is going to be yellow. All right. How could I make just the calendar yellow and not the... just the calendar yellow and not the paragraph as well. Pardon me? Well, actually I'm hearing two answers and they're both definitely on the right track. Um, the one thing I could do is I know the ID of this HTML element. 
right? This, this ID that exists on the ASP.NET control is going to be the ID that that HTML element is going to get. So I could go in and I could say calendar2. And then when I run it, not the whole div gets it, but just that calendar gets it. All right, so that's one way of doing it. An alternative way to do it would be what, uh, what you had described, except I wouldn't say custom calendar, because again, that calendar isn't going to be a calendar tag on the client side, but I could say custom table. And what that would do is any table within that custom div gets this style. So you're definitely on the right track there. All right, and then I could go from there to make the table the way I would want it to be. I could make T, oops. We'll try to make a real ugly table so that it's vivid. We can make a width of, you know, um, 100, 100%. We can make the THs have a background of white. And a color of blue. We can make the TDs be, let's say, reverse. So now when we go and run this, <laughs> there's our table. Oh, yeah, I can't read it. Not particularly good, but oh well. Uh, because those are actually links. I would have to go and change the length within a TD. And, oh, yeah, that's a lot better. <laughs> All right. You get the idea. Now, what's the point of this to make an ugly table? The point is, again, the one way to do it is to use some of the formatting capabilities that are within the .NET platform within, that, that you can configure using the Design View of Visual Studio or you could, you could code it yourself if you wanted to. The other thing, though, is you can still use CSS. In fact, usually that's what I do. Why do I do that? Again, for all the benefits that, that CSS offers, etc. But in order to use CSS, all right, you have to understand the HTML that's going to get generated. All right? Because it's not necessarily always obvious what to put the, what to put the uh, uh, tag on all right, or what to put the style rule for. Remember your three options. You can put it on an HTML tag, you can put it on a um, class, you can put it on an ID, and you can mix and match like we did, put it on a, an a, a HTML element within a certain ID. All right, so that's your options. As long as you can point to one of those things, hey, I know the class of that element, I know the ID of the element, I know the HTML that it's going to generate, then you can go in and you can write your style rule to do that. So. A lot of times students come with me or come to me with questions and say, how do I style this? All right? I have an error message that I want to configure to look a different way. What I usually tell them is, go and bring up the HTML for it, view source, and look at the HTML for that and see, do you have anything to sort of hook on to? Do you have an ID that you can hook onto? Do you have a class that you can hook onto? Do you have an HTML tag or any combination of those? So it's important to uh, understand the HTML that these generate when you want to style it. Uh, I'll, I'll mention this. This will probably be the first time of a dozen times I mention this in class. I actually was asked to write a chapter in a, a textbook about ASP.NET. 
And as it turned out, they didn't use my chapter because I really had a, a you know, professional dispute with the author. The author thought I talked too much about HTML in this. They said, hey, this is an ASP.NET. These folks don't know uh, HTML and all that. In my mind, you can't really develop HTML.NET, or, or I'm sorry, ASP.NET unless you know HTML. You always have to realize that that connection, that this generates that. Without that, you're going to be floundering trying to figure out how to style these things. The good news is, is I got paid anyhow, so, you know. <laughs> I did the work. I did what they asked me to. They just didn't like it, so, yeah, whatever. I have a question. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. With that philosophy, the the CSS would be the way to go. Then, because then the CSS is an aspect of the appearance of the page or an aspect of the presentation, and then the other stuff would be um, elsewhere. So, yeah. So, yeah just the exactly. It, it, exactly. And if you think about it, you know, in a web environment, you know. Um, a well-rounded web developer will have, you know, will, will have a bunch of skills. But in some places, you may have people that focus on the graphic design. So they may mock up a web page in, in pure HTML and get a real sharp-looking style sheet that way. But they don't know beans about ASP.NET. They'll then turn that over to the developer and say, make your ASP.NET pages look like that. Well, that'll work as long as you guys are communicating with each other. The two parties are communicating with each other. And they keep things in a CSS file, and you don't do anything with appearance in the ASP.NET code. So yeah, that's really why I favor the CSS approach uh, to styling it in, in, H, uh, in, uh, in the ASP.NET. Now, I will say, there's a catch here. One thing that ASP styling does that isn't easily done purely with CSS are things like making alternate rows in the table different colors. So for example, let's go to the visual view here. And I'll auto format. And I'll select, yeah, let's select, let's select this one. If I go and run this, and I do a view source, it would be hard for me to write CSS to emulate this look, where Monday and Sunday. It wouldn't be hard to do if I was doing it all in HTML. It would be hard for me to use an ASP.NET control to generate a calendar and then write CSS for it. There's, a, there's ways around that when we get to themes, again, that we'll, that we'll talk about and we'll touch on. All right, excellent. We'll keep this page like this, and we'll move on to our next control. Uh, my next control is dedicated. I think there's, I think there's only one. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. It's dedicated to the people who struggled last semester through CISS 232, writing their own validations by hand. All right. Uh, we do this in CISS 2.32, we write in PHP, and there really isn't the framework in PHP. There's language and instructions, but you don't really have the advantage of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how the, validate, the validator works, the validation control works. Um, and I'll go in and I will create a second page. And I'll call it input. And of course, I could apply the same style sheet if I want to. In the interest of time, I won't do that. Let's do this one in design view. I'll go in and I will put a text box up here. And I'll put a button in here. Now, 
There's no code to process that, right? This is just going to go and, and run, all right? But we can pretend that this text box has to have a value in it. Otherwise, something bad's going to happen. Any value? Any value. We'll start with any value, and then we'll build from there. All right. So right now, I can submit that form over and over again. And notice it is, in fact, submitting it, because you can see if you look closely down here, you can see that it's hitting the server. It's just happening so quick. All right. And I don't have any special code to process it, so we don't see any difference. But again, trust me, it, it's, it's submitting it. But we would want it not to submit. Right? Ideally, we would want it, if, if that's a required field, we'd want there you know, to, to be stopped if you try to submit it and there's nothing there. So, if we were doing this in PHP, what we'd do is we'd write an onSubmit function to validate, and the validate would look at the text box and see, you know, through JavaScript and see if there's a value in it. If there was a value in it, that's fine. If there wasn't a value in it, display an error message. All right? That's something that every web application ought to be doing with their form data, right? You know, there's, I can't think of any uh, a web application, well, yeah, it don't matter if you enter anything or not, right? You know, you got to enter something in it. And, and oftentimes it goes beyond that. You have to enter something in that is a valid date or a valid email address or whatever. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, uh, in addition to my text box, I'm going to use a, under validation, a required field validator. And I'm just going to drag that up and put it, I'm going to try to put it between the text box and the button. And I'm not going to worry about the way it looks right now. I can, I can deal with the styling later on. All right? If we have time, we'll do it today. If not, you know, I'll do it Tuesday or, you know, we'll just never do it. All right? So, now I have a required field validator. But I'm not quite there yet, right? <laughs> Remember, these components give you a head start to your job. They don't do your whole job for you. What we still have to do is we have to sort of wire these things together. We have to connect or configure these components. We have to say that this required field validator is associated with this text box. So I go in and I say that required field validator is associated with that text box. And oh yeah, I want, I'm going to give it a CSS class of error message. All right. That won't have any effect right now, but it will. All right, it will when we get to styling it. And I'm going to change the error message to say, you know, must enter a value. Three explanation points, so they really know that I mean business. Now when we run this, notice what happens when we click the button. We'll notice a couple things happen. It gives me my error message, but if you're watching down there, that's not flicking. Right? It's not submitting it back to itself. It's not submitting it to the server for processing, which is a good thing. Right? Um, validation is one of the things that we do typically both on uh, the client side and the server side. And let me, let me review why we do that. I wish I had the, um, wish I had the uh, document camera to, to, to draw things for this. But, Let's say we go to enter an order at Amazon and we don't have a credit card number. The server can't possibly va uh, process that order, right? You know, it's not going to let me order something and not say how I'm going to pay for it, right? So, th so that order is doomed. It's not going to work, all right? Therefore, why even waste the server's time by giving them data that is clearly not right, all right? So what we do is we write code on the client side. When we download the, the order form page, 
we have JavaScript that whenever the user tries to submit that form, the JavaScript fires up and looks to see if the credit card number is filled in. If the credit card number is not filled in, it stops the presses and doesn't let that order go through. Right? This really is a win-win situation. All right? It's a win for the server because it doesn't have to deal with an order that can't possibly work, right? that can't possibly be processed because there's no credit card number. It's also a win for the client. And it's a win for the client because they're going to get their error message quickly all right? instead of having to wait for the server go in, think about it for a while, and then say, hey, I can't process this order. There's no credit card number. So we'd like to do we, 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 we want to do validation on the client side to provide the, the user with a quicker response of something that's obviously wrong. All right. And that's also good for the server, because the server then doesn't have to deal with uh, data that is just wrong. It just isn't right. All right. Now, we also do validation on the server side. All right, and we do that for two reasons. First of all, JavaScript can be turned off. All right, you can go in your browser and you can say, "I don't want to run any JavaScript." Boy, that'd be a nice thing to do, right? Turn off your JavaScript. You don't have to enter a credit card number and get free orders from Amazon. I doubt that. All right, but just in case, they're going to have validation exist on the server side as well just in case JavaScript is turned off. In addition, they're likely to do more involved validation on the server side. The kind of validation I described on the client side was something like make sure you entered something in for a credit card number. All right? I could even do better than that and make sure that a certain number of digits were entered in, right? because like five isn't a valid credit card number. Right? Credit card numbers are, what, 15, 16 digits long. Right? So I could make sure that 15 to 16 digits are entered in. I could even make sure they were all numbers, right? because credit cards don't con uh, contain uh, uh, letters. But what I couldn't do on the client side is go out to the database and see, is that credit card over its limit? Is that credit card been reported stolen? Has that credit card expired? Uh, does the credit card match the name on the order? And so on and so forth. So some validation will require some sort of additional processing that's not possible or desirable to do on the client side. Again, I can validate easily on the client side something like was something entered? Was the right number of characters entered? Are all the characters numbered? That's like easy, straightforward validation. On the server side, I'm going to repeat that validation just in case someone's trying to slip through by disabling uh, their JavaScript. And I'm going to add to that additional validation that requires resources such as a database that can only be accessed from the server. All right. So at any rate, the one nice thing is, is the, these ASP.NET controls fire off both on the client and server. So whatever validation happens on the client, also happens on the server. So in essence, um, if client-side validation is enabled, you know, it gets validated twice. So what? Passes both times. All right? If it fails, though, it never makes it to the server if client-side scripting is enabled. If client-side scripting is not enabled, it will make it to the server, but the server will catch the air and display it. All right? Now, um, let's see. About styling these. One way I could do it is by putting in a class in my style sheet for error message. We can't see it. Oh, thank you. Whoops. Can't see anything now. Where'd I go? Oh, 
Oh, I hit the student camera. That's what I did. Maybe not. Wow. There's going to be someone coming run down from the control room any minute. Okay, there it goes. Okay, there it's looking into the garbage can. Here it goes. Here it goes. Here I am. Yay. All right. Okay. At any rate, if you remember, when I created that control, one of the attributes in it was CSS class. So that's going to be my hook to this error. All right. Now, I could, the other hook I could use is I could use this ID of required validator one. Right? But I think instead I'm going to use the class of error message as sort of my hook to write my style rule. Why do you suppose that is? Why am I deciding to use the class instead of the ID? That way all messages kind of Exactly. As I add to this form, I might add other error messages and I probably want those to look the same way. All right. So what I'll do here is, let me close out of everything. Let me go here and I'll put in the CSS now. Notice what IntelliSense did. I typed in REL and nothing popped up. That indicated to me I typed something wrong in before. That's a nice feature again of IntelliSense. That if you start typing something in and you expect to see something pop up and it doesn't, you probably made a mistake. Okay, so now I can go in here and I can put in for the class of, and what did I call it again? Air message? Yeah. I can do something uh, cliched like making the text color red. But in addition to that, I'm going to make the font size bigger. Right? You never just represent something via color because someone could be colorblind and, and not get the meaning of it. So it's okay to use color, but use color with something else. So now we can go and do this and yeah, I brought out the default, this one I called input. I can go click that and I get a big error message saying must enter a value. I had a complaint for my 216 class, by the way, if you remember the example I brought up from there because it was blue and, and yellow. Um, totally inadvertently, this one is scarlet and gray. So, all right. They should be in this class. They would have been happy with this. Okay. So again, you see, the, in that case, the class gave me the hook into it. And I deliberately picked class for the reason that the student mentioned, and that is because I kind of know I'm likely to have more error messages, and therefore, as such, I want all of them to kind of have the same look. So I'm going to put that based on a class as opposed to based on an ID. What I'd like to do is do one more kind of validator. Because that is literally just a required field validator, so I can type anything into it and um, it, it'll, it'll accept it. By the way, what I usually do is the pages I'm working on, I'll right mouse on and say set a start page.
got to stop debugging, right? Right mouse set a start page. And that way it doesn't matter what I'm looking at, it will bring up that page. So I can type any garbage in here and it will accept it. All right. Now, what if I would want this to be... Yeah. What if I wanted this to validate not just that it was entered, not just that something was entered, but maybe that what was entered was a valid email address. Okay? I have another validator to do that. You can have more than one validator per control. And at first that kind of sounds clunky, like gee, I have all these validators, but actually it's good because it allows you to mix and match. For example, I'm going to validate to make sure this is an email. Uh, address, a valid email address. And I want to make sure that they enter it, so I'm going to have a required field validator, I'm going to have a regular expression validator. Now you might say, gee, couldn't it just be an option on the, or couldn't it just be on the regular expression operator if I want it to be an email address to require it? Well, not necessarily. The form may be such that it's required and it must be an email address. Or the form might be such that the field isn't required, but if you do type something in, it has to be a valid email address. So by supplying the separate components to do each little job, it gives you a lot more flexibility um, in a fairly straightforward way. Um, in terms of good software design, you know, oftentimes what's most, um, most reusable and, and again helps maintainability the most, is when you have these little components that do one job. The more elaborate components get, oftentimes that limits their reusability because they do too much. All right? So I'm going to go in, I'm going to pop in this regular expression validator. I'm going to do the same sort of things I did before. I'm going to say must enter email address. I'm going to give it the same CSS class, so it's going to look the same. Error message. I'm going to say the control I want to validate is text box 1 and the validation expression, I'm going to click on the three dots and select an internet email address. And it comes up with a really elaborate regular expression. Regular expressions are a way of matching patterns. All right. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to say something. I'm not going to say anything. And I'm certainly not going to say it uh, when I'm being recorded. All right. Paul's a good guy and a good teacher, but so, you know, I'm not, no comment. I'm sure he had his reasons. All right. Um, regular expressions, by the way, go beyond .NET. These are used in a lot of different contexts and all that. And they're, they're sort of a bear to figure out sometimes. That's why it's good that it did it for you. Notice what it does for you. It has pre-written French phone numbers, German phone numbers, Japanese phone numbers, PRC phone numbers. I'm not even sure what that is. U.S. phone number, U.S. Social Security number. Ah, oh, People's Republic of China. Very good. All right, um, now, let's say your organization has a certain rule for part numbers. You know, like sometimes a part number has to be two letters followed by four numbers. You can write your own regular expression to validate for that. So I could, cre I could click custom and then create, construct my own regular expression that says, hey, this is validating the part number and it has to be two letters followed by four numbers. So you can extend these to, to whatever you like, but it is nice and it does some pre-rent ones for you. It does, you know, um, internet email address. So now I can go in and run this. And if I type nothing in, I get must enter a value. If I type garbage in, it tells me I must enter an email address. Now, the nice thing is, is if we look at this, 
Again, what we'll see is we'll see all these sort of JavaScript libraries and, and different things and all that um, to call some of these, this, these code and all that. And again, it generates all that for you. It has to be HTML, JavaScript, CSS for the web browser to handle it. Right? So anything you put on the page, um, when you're writing the source code, anything that's on the server gets translated to one of those things. Uh, before you go. Now these are examples of common things that many web applications will have to do. Right? Validate form data is probably like the classic one. Now prior to ASP.NET, you know, back when it was just plain old ASP, or like now in PHP or other languages, if you have something like this, you might do a hundred validations on different pages. You either have to write all hundred of them yourself, or write your own library, or maybe use a third party library and sort of tack it onto your code. All of those are not quite as good as having it built right into the framework where you can, you can just pop it in and it, and it comes with the deal. All right? Um, we'll go over all these things in more detail. Um, the important stuff here is not necessarily the specific controls that I showed you or the specific components, but sort of the philosophy behind what they do. And that they take very common behavior and by simply including them and doing a little configuring, telling it what control you want to validate, what error message, how you want to validate it and that, you can go and uh, much more quickly build your uh, web development, uh, web application. Nice thing is, is, again, as far as we talked about testing, what would it take to truly test a validation routine for an email address? You'd have to enter in a lot of stuff. You'd have to enter in that or something that looks like that. You'd have to enter in this, right? Because that's not valid. 